Good evening, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Cambodia Global Dialogue of Southeast Asia TV. Tonight, uh, uh, I have a, a long-time friend, you know, about four or five years. You know, we knew each other. Uh, and we have a chance uh, a few years ago to uh, have a good uh, discussion on the, uh, you know, the development of the life insurance industry. It's been a while, and I'm glad that I managed to get him back this time. But, you know, with a few more years under his belt, and um, so I, I think the conversation will be uh, much more uh, in-depth, uh, you know, uh, and I hope that the you know, you can appreciate the, the topic that we will have today, which is uh, the development of the life insurance industry. You know, in the context of the ASEAN economic community, you know, uh, we, the economy is doing well, the middle class is rising. There's different expectation. And one thing for sure is that uh, life insurance as an industry is getting more and more uh, developed. You know, people understand more and more the, the, the industry. But uh, I will not talk more about that. I would rather leave it uh, to the expert, uh, my friend Robert Elliott, who is, uh, you know, the, you're the CEO of uh, Manulife Cambodia, right? Yeah. Yes, and thank you for uh, inviting me on the show, Dr. Saksipana. Call me Sipana, my friend. Sipana. Sipana. Okay. okay, well, great yes, to see yeah, you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, a lot has happened uh, since we last uh, spoke. Um, you know, as you know, uh, uh, we came here back in 2012. Yes. So we were um, one of the first companies to open up yes. in Cambodia and the first international company. Yes. And, you know, it was a remarkable experience for me and has been mm. because it's the, you know, the country uh, didn't have a life mm. insurance industry mm. yeah. um, at all. And yet this is an industry which is actually mm. three to four hundred years old. Three, four hundred years old, really? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the concept started where? Europe? The concept America. started in the UK. The UK, uh, yeah, yeah. It, had to be. Uh, it can be America because uh, they're less than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, it really started out where um, it actually started with successful business people. They mm. had large families. Yes. Running in the 17th, 18th century, their commerce was emerging. And if the breadwinner mm. died, yes. usually these uh, businessmen had large families mm. and fairly quickly they would lose the business and they would end up in the poor house. Wow. So a group of them came up with the idea that they should put money into a mutual fund and that should any one of them die, mm. that their family would be looked after and that very simple idea mm. started to grow and it's actually had and we can talk about this later but it's actually had huge impact on the world economy mm, interesting huh? because in, in, in what way well if you think about it um, what started to happen was that more people became members yes but it occurred to those that were starting the industry that an older person mm. probably would die sooner. Sooner, yeah, yeah. And a younger person mm. would die later. Yeah, yeah. And so they needed to come up with some ideas around an older person should maybe pay a bit more mm. and a younger person should pay a bit, a less. bit less. Yeah. Quite and so the first actuaries yes. started. And actually is what? Is a profession, right? It's a, it's a profession. Yeah. And um, when we first came to Cambodia, yeah, yeah. there were no actuaries. Yes. Um, and so we have um, uh, brought in students. What, 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 what does an actuary do? Well, they make calculations. Okay. They're like uh, statisticians? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. You know, they make calculations. Um, uh, they design products. Mm. Uh, they study mortality tables. Okay. Um, and they look long term uh, uh, how an individual, uh, if they invest their money, the likelihood that any percentage would mm. die, the percentage that would live, yes, yes. And, and so on. So those actuaries, I and mean, I'm not an actuary, yes, you know, yes. and any actuary watching this will, will be yeah. obvious to them. Um, but it is, uh, they call it actuarial science, okay. and um, they are the, really the backbone of designing products in mm. this, in this mm. industry. So going back to the early days, they started to 
um, uh, come up with these tables that allowed it people from all ranges mm. of life yeah. to be able to participate. Now, three things happened yeah. okay. with the beginning of this uh, industry. One, it actually gave people security, long term. Okay. Uh, if something happened to them, their families were looked after. So it had a social impact. Yes. So the very beginnings of people having the dignity of having yes. money mm. should the breadwinner die. Yes. The second thing was that it allowed people to start planning long term. They were able to say, if I put this money away, mm -hmm. probability is we're going to live. Yes. So when we get older oh. and we have things like wanting to pay for our children's education yes. or mm -hmm. retirement, we would have that money. Okay. But then, actually, um, they discovered that they had large amounts of money now on deposit. Mm. And they were wondering what to do with it. What to do with it, yes. And they came up with the idea that the government would like to borrow it uh -huh. through government Interesting. bonds. Interesting. Interesting. And they then were able to invest in the country's infrastructure. So they said, the government would say, we want to build roads. Yes. We want to build um, uh, hospitals. Yes. We want to build schools. Mm -hmm. We want to build universities. Yeah. And the actuaries knew that they didn't need this money hmm. for maybe 10 or 15 years. Yes. yes. Now, okay. they needed some money yes. for... For some claims. Some, some claims. Yeah. But the vast majority of it... Yes. ...could we'll actually... Live on for a long while. ...put to work. Yes. And they knew that the customers wouldn't be coming for the money because they'd... Yes. ...taken the policy out for 10 hmm. or 15 years. And so what happened was that the economy benefited. Hmm. They were investing in the infrastructure. Yes. And, uh, of course, then, people then had higher standard of living. Mm. They bought more policies. Okay. And more people were able to do it. So it's a snowballing effect. And so the industry became mm. very, very important. The big pension funds, the yes. big life funds, okay. have been the great facilitators mm. of capital. Now... Public good. 300 years ago. 300 years ago. So now available. we come to Cambodia. Yeah. Fast forward. Why? What made Manulife consider Cambodia? Because back then, I mean, mm. as far back, you know, as uh, ten years, five years ago, you know, it's uh, we 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 there's a financial crisis a bit, but then we mm. just entered the WTO, the, the economy attracting investment, but uh, not as dynamic as today. But five years ago, what made mm -hmm. uh, your company decide to consider Cambodia? as a potential mm -hmm. country to expand your operation? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. And it goes back to the history of the company. Yes. Manulife was established in 1887 in 1887, Toronto, yeah. Canada. Ah, OK. 130 years ago. Yes. So in 1887. Slightly older than us. Uh, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they uh, established the company back in 1887 in Canada. Um, and it was called the Manufacturing Insurance Group of oh, Canada. That's where the Manu is. That's where the Manu comes from. Okay. Okay, because at that time, Canada was an agricultural, seen, seen as an agricultural country. Yes. And they wanted the world to know that this was going to be, this was a company that, that, that they were going to call it the Manufacturers Insurance Group of mm. Canada. And its intention was always to be an international company. Yeah. So 10 years later, in 1897, Manulife opened up in Hong Kong, Shanghai. In Asia? In Asia, 120 years ago. So it always had international ambitions, especially in Asia. Mm. And so Manulife developed then into 11 countries in Asia. Your footprint in Asia is 11 countries? Yes, yes. Japan, oh, yeah. Singapore. Oh. Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, um, China. You're pretty much all in ASEAN, no? Yeah. So, to answer your question, why did Manulife come to Cambodia? Mm. Well, we are a long-term business. Yeah. When somebody buys a policy from us, they're buying it for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. So, life companies tend to have a long time horizon when they're yeah. looking into the, the future. And Cambodia was seen as a, a country that was obviously part of ASEAN, yeah. that it was, its economy was emerging, it was having very, very dynamic growth, yeah. I think 7.5% a year, 
uh, and that has continued, I think, on average over the last 10 years. Mm. And so as part of our, our, our Asian footprint, we thought, well, we should mm. consider going into Cambodia. And um, we were very fortunate mm. that um, uh, uh, MEF uh, invited us to, to, to come and uh, we applied for our license. And our research showed that uh, Cambodia is uh, economically young. Mm. It has uh, the average age, I think it's about 23, 24 yeah. years old. Mm. And we could see an opportunity for us to establish a very good business here. For me personally, um, you know, I didn't know a great deal about Cambodia other than I remember as a student, okay. um, uh, you know, reading and seeing, yes. um, uh, you know, some of the tragic events that had occurred mm. in the country. So I didn't know that much about it. But it was a unique opportunity to come here and launch an industry which mm. the people of Cambodia had never really enjoyed before. That was uh, very bold on your part you know, uh, to uh, come to a country starting from scratch. Not yeah. easy when you are the pioneer, because yeah. you, as you can say, you, 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 you are facing, you know, sort of like a, a blank eye, you know, you talk about like, what is that, you know? <laughs> yes. uh, and I can imagine the early days when you have to go through so many effort, you know, because uh, occasionally I receive invitation on, you know, sometimes on the newspaper, sometimes it's a, uh, sort of like some press release. Mm -hmm. All this activity in terms of building mm -hmm. the awareness of the industry to the mm -hmm. population. How well were you doing mm -hmm. in terms of uh, reaching out to the, to, 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 to the, the public? Yeah, that was a challenge because, you know, people view life insurance mm -hmm. as death insurance. As, as what? Death. As death. Ah. I'm only going to buy this if I'm going to die. If I'm going to die, yes. <laughs> right, oh. and none of us plan to die. Yes, yes. So yes, therefore... Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. None of us <laughs> Give me some hope. <laughs> yes. So none of us plan to die, and certainly we don't plan to die today. So therefore, um, you know, why would I buy this hmm. product? Hmm. Um, so, you know, that is very difficult. Yeah. And so we needed to uh, help people understand mm. that uh, life insurance is for the living. Mm. It's actually for people who save and want to build capital up for their families, for their children. Mm. And we have products that help people do that. Mm. But the reality is, is that not everybody who left for work mm. today yeah. will arrive home tonight. Mm. That's just That's a, reality. a harsh reality. That yeah. is a harsh it's reality. Everywhere. It happens everywhere. And so when you have people who are beginning to earn more money, mm. who are have their lifestyle becoming uh, increasing, and that they're beginning to think more long term, and they have real dreams for their families, then you need to make plans that if something did happen, how do I ensure that financially I don't die? Mm -hmm. You know, I may have died physically, I may not be here, and emotionally that's a big wrench, mm -hmm. but can I in some way mm -hmm. ensure that the money and the income that I would have earned in the years to come. And for most of us, we underestimate how much we earn. Yes. If you go back 30 years, yes. if you were able to speak to um, Soxipana as your younger self yes. and said, how much do you think you will earn yeah. from the age of 25? Yes, you're to, right. <clears throat> you would say, probably a lot less than you really have. You're right, I agree. And your agree. assets and so on. Yes, yes. And none of that would have happened. Mm if something had happened to yes, you. Yes, you're, right, you're right. None of it would have happened mm. for your family, yes. for your wife, for your relatives and so on. But happily, mm. you've had a great life. Yes. But for some people, that doesn't happen. Mm. And so when we first started, it was getting people to understand that concept. Yeah. And uh, very gradually, mm. people did start to say, actually, um, this has a benefit which I had never thought about before. Wow. Well, I, I, I think uh, Robert is, is, uh, 
is a good time to take a short break uh, because you have pretty much set the stage already, you know, as to the industry, as to the reason why the company is back. And when we come back from the break, I want to go a little bit deeper on, you know, how do you build trust, you know, uh, in the public when, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new thing. Uh, like anything new, uh, uh, people just don't trust, mm. you know. So let's take a short mm -hmm. break. And then uh, we can talk a bit later. Okay. Uh, Robert, you know, as I said earlier, earning the trust from the public who are still not uh, well exposed to such a new concept as life insurance and to expect them to uh, put their future, their life, huh? I mean, we talk about life here, about their future the future of their kids, their education, in uh, something which is a piece of paper, mm. I mean, it's a bit hard, you know, yeah. it's a new concept. How, how, how have you done, what, what have you done to earn their trust? Well, I think that a really important uh, point that you make, that uh, building trust um, with our customers and our clients and our future customers, yeah is very important and um, we started off actually the, the Ministry of Economic and Finance uh, uh, talked to us about this right yes. at the very beginning and um, they said look we need to run some education seminars and would you be willing to participate in these because you know we do need to try and help people understand yes. uh, first of all you know the products we talked about earlier and the concept but then actually the trust in the in, in the company which um, you know and I'm very passionate about yeah. Manulife. Um, I started with Manulife in 1980 mm. so I joined Manulife in the UK mm. and um, I've you know seen the company grow and develop in that in that time and um, so I personally obviously have uh, a lot of faith in our, in our company. Mm. Um, Manulife has 20 million customers globally. Whoa, 20 million. Um, so we're serving. It's larger than the population in Cambodia. Um, Manulife pays out every year, virtually, as in the last year, over 19 billion US dollars to our customers in claims, interest payments to them. Um, uh, maturities mm. and so on. So the company's financially very, very strong. Yes. Now none of that means a great deal to somebody who's never heard of the company, mm. who's going to put his hard-earned or her hard-earned money into a manual life policy. So it was important that um, we do what we say we're going to do. Mm -hmm and that uh, in the seminars people were able to ask us questions and we've had over 70,000 people come to some seminar or other over the last four years mm. and uh, they ask me questions about our commitment to Cambodia yes and you know I tell them that uh, uh, you know manual life's history in Asia yeah. the fact that we've been here for over 120 years yes. the fact that we are in other ASEAN countries mm. and we've been for example in the Philippines since uh, 1905 I think it is that manual life first opened its yes. operations yes. in the Philippines that manual life has been in Asia through two world wars <laughs> And at that time, yes. you know, uh, uh, you know, Asia was very much involved in that. The yes. company didn't leave. Yes, it stayed it in those countries. Yeah. And when those country, when the war ended, yeah. the business then continued. Mm. And I think people who have enjoyed life insurance for mm. many, many years, their yes. grandparents would yes. say, "Manual life stayed mm. in those countries mm. at that time." Mm -hmm. Um, and so at the end of the day, people will ask me these questions and they can check it out. Mm. Of course, they can go into Google and, uh, and things like that. Um, but I remember the very first customer mm. thinking, you know, we've got our first customer. Yeah. And um, then I remember 10 customers, mm. uh -huh. uh, you know, and these were people who, you know, wanted to buy our policies. Yes. And then I remember when we had a thousand. Yes. And I thought, Will we wow. ever get to 10,000? Yes. 
And now we have over 22,000 wow. lives that we're wow. insuring. We, It's um, quite a, a, a growth. Yeah, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the trust that yes, those people you're right. are putting. I, at the end of the day, it's all about trust. Yes. And collectively, we've insured them for over 400 million US dollars. So that's money that one day, hmm. if anything happens to them, will be paid. Will be paid. And yes. that money goes into Cambodia. Yes. So those people can take it. Mm. and obviously mm. help mm. the standard of their living mm. And, mm. and look after their children. Going forward, those policies will mature. Yeah. And, you know, we are, you know, when people invest in a, in a life insurance policy, it's the only product, mm. really, that is worth more the day after yes. than the day before. Well, well, let me cut you a bit because you did mention you know, uh, this 400 million that one day it's be part of the, uh, is in Cambodia, right? So in that sense, there's a, a lot of uh, public good effect, you know, uh, in terms of mm. uh, the, the, the effect on the economy, for mm. example. How, how do you see life insurance contributing to the, the, the country economic growth, for example? Well, I see, first of all, the social benefit. Yes. So, um, uh, and we have paid out claims to, to, to some of our customers, yes, you yes. know. And it's sad, but we do it yes. as quickly and as speedily yes, yes, as, yeah. we, as we can. Yes. That money um, means that those families are no longer a burden, mm. either on the state yeah. or, or other relatives. Yes. They are financially independent. Yes. For as long as the breadwinner decided they wanted that to be, yes. to be the case. Yes. Um, going forward, as those policies start to mature and start to pay out, yes. people spend their money in Cambodia. Yes. And yes. so that money is going back into right. or going into yes. to the, the economy. Um, you then have, you know, I alluded to earlier, uh, what does the life companies do hmm. with the funds that actually start to grow in the country? Yes. And the life insurance industry here is growing fast. There yes. are four companies now mm, developing, okay. yeah, and all yeah. those companies are doing well. They're yes. developing, and um, there will come uh, uh, the opportunity where Cambodia will need to develop the financial instruments yes, yes. that uh, facilitate that investment mm. into into the economy. Yeah. So all economies around the world, mm. and if you look at the advanced economies. Yes. The life insurance industry, the pensions industry, play a huge role mm -hmm. in facilitating the investment in the mm -hmm. infrastructure in those uh, mm -hmm. those uh, those countries. Uh, Robert, uh, before we talk a bit about trust, right? How important it is, you know, for people to trust in something that is as intangible. But uh, along with trust, uh, the other side of trust is about uh, the the literacy. You know, mm -hmm. about understanding more about the industry. How uh, have you seen, you know, over the last several years, the the understanding of? Uh, well, you mentioned that you you, you have uh, exposed to some seventy thousand for various workshop and everything, training seminar with Ministry of Finance, that sort of thing. But you know, do you see that as uh, education system? You know, like for example, in the, the, the banking sector, we're talking a lot about the financial literacy. You know, it's important that uh, as a society, in the early day, we start understanding that these are something we need to know. Not as good as math, as uh, science, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a, uh, you know, uh, literacy in this part is very important. Mm -hmm. Have, uh, do you see or have you seen already that uh, within the larger state sector, that their effort uh, to to do more literacy, you know, for the public, or is this purely an industry-specific uh, literacy program? Do you mean do I see the um, uh, the industry doing yes. more of this training? Yes, or yeah, the industry or the state, for example, w would would have. Uh, you know, program with the with the industry to say, look, we we need to educate more people to mm -hmm. better understand, you know, uh, like they do in yeah. uh, in the financial yeah. sector. Here, uh, life insurance is also part of the financial sector, yeah. Yeah. but it's it's one product, if I can say, uh, within the overall 
uh, product portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what would you have done more? Uh, let's say you, you go back. What would you have done more to build more understanding of the of the of the industry? Um, right, that's a difficult question. What would we do differently? What do we think we could do more? Um, you must have done something right to to get the seven thousand yeah. people there. You know, it, uh, it's a good well, start. Abso absolutely, to get that number of people to come and listen. Yes. Um, well, I think we have a great opportunity in Cambodia. Yes. And because the industry is new in Cambodia, yes. there's a level of curiosity. Yes. So if you go to some of the more advanced economies, yes. the developing ones mm. where the life insurance industry is 100 years old, people are almost bombarded by 10, 15, yes, 20 yes. different life companies. Yes. Uh, they have friends in the industry, their parents bought policies, mm. uh, their grandparents yeah. had policies. Yeah. And so the opportunity to run those kind of mm. seminars is much more difficult. Mm. I think we had a great opportunity mm. here, and we do in Cambodia, that have, people are have, have you tackled also uh, some key provincial town? Because as you know, with the 20-some uh, with year of uh, steady 7% growth, yep. uh, you know, I was very shocked, uh, happily shocked, you know, when uh, the World Bank released, uh, I think last month, a study to show that our you know, because of the sustained growth, you know, the, the poverty rate have dramatically dropped yes. know, 20 years ago from 53% yes. to now 14%. Yes. So, so uh, by default, not everybody is in Phnom Penh. So like key provincial town like Battambang, yeah. the granary of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Cambodia and different other, and uh, Siem Reap, Siem have, have Have you reached out? to people that far? We, we have, and in oh, fact, good. it was one of the things good. that um, when we first came to, yes. to, um, uh, to Cambodia, we were given the impression that um, it was all happening in Phnom Penh, mm. and that's the only place really where the life insurance industry yes. could, could really uh, flourish, um, that this was a cash society. Yes. So, um, you know, we needed to be able to collect cash yes. from, our, from our customers. And these were two things, actually, that um, we learned very quickly yeah. that actually were not strictly true. Mm. And after about a year, we opened up in Siem Reap. Okay, all right. And all right. Uh, we were running our education um, uh, seminars there. Yes. Uh, people were asking really good questions mm. about policies mm. and what policy was applicable to them. And our business went extremely well yes. in, in, in Phnom Penh, or in, in Siem Reap. And then we moved to Battambon. Yes. So we opened up an office in Battambon. Okay, okay. And we then opened up in, in, in Camp Pujam. Um, we have a number of bank partners, yeah. and they have offices in the provinces. And we have found that those offices have done extremely well. Okay. And so your observation is absolutely right that um, the the ripple effect mm. of the economy going out into the provinces obviously has had a very, very positive impact. Mm. Mm. But the other thing was that I had never worked, though I'd been with Manual Lives since 1980, I had never worked in a cash society really before. Okay. All our transactions were done through electronically yes. through banks you know? yes. even in my early days in yes, the UK yes. you know, yes, that's yes. how it was done one day somebody came to me and said um, have you thought of mobile banking hmm. and I thought well hmm. in Cambodia yeah. and uh, you know we met uh, one of the main mobile banking yes. providers in, yes. in, in Wing okay. and okay. it was amazing that um, so many people in Cambodia transfer money through that electronic uh, basis whereby they can do it through their mobile phone or go to a, um, uh, one of their shops. That's a new economy. And, you know, when I explained this to people mm. in our head office, they thought, Cricky, you yes. know, um, because our business in Vietnam is cash. Yes. And we have a lot of cash collectors sure. wow. but Cambodia is showing them yes actually we do electronic <laughs> yeah all over the provinces uh, you know yeah, yeah. and I just think that you can't learn that actually you've got to have the experience yes. of Cambodia to really understand yes. it 
And so, though I am the oldest person in the office, yes. I feel Cambodia has made me younger. Yes. Because I'm much more open now mm. to think, right, some of the preconceptions I've yes. had have uh, not been correct. Mm. So, what other ways are there for us to reach more yeah. customers and to talk to them in a way that they want to be talked to? So, this whole digital age yeah, 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 is, know, I, is, I, is taking I, off here. I must say, in Cambodia, uh, things are moving so fast right and being a latecomer uh, you know sometimes it's good because you can catch the latest technological you, you can leapfrog leapfrog yes with technological development with all this innovation that initially have nothing to do with us right yeah but suddenly with the end user yeah you know and look at the facebook uh, and the social media and i think you know to me technology is probably the greatest equalizer Yes. Uh, between advanced economy and not so advanced economy yeah, yeah. because it bring them to equal playing field. Yeah. You would never thought that five years, four years ago when you come to Cambodia, my God, Cambodia is a cash economy and now it's all done electronically. Yeah. It's amazing and I think the wing is everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, and you people, know. they are, and people um, um, trust it. Yes. And th this is the thing you see, it's the experience. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, and that's why in, in, in manual life, though, though we are a long-term business, yes. um, you know, when we have a claim, we deal with it, mm. it very, very quickly. Mm. We have to establish what's happened, yes. and then we pay the family as yes. quickly as possible. And that is the real proof, you know, that the yes. experience mm. of are you doing what you say you're yes. doing. Yes. And, you know, I believe so much in yeah. the miracle of life insurance. Yes. With just a drop of ink and yes. a signature, mm. you create for a family yeah. a lot of money. Robert, uh, good time to take another break. And when we come back, I want to uh, focus more on what, what sort of product and service that uh, is available in the market and, and that your company is doing. Because I, I think that people would start to understand better. Because, yeah. you know, we've been talking about for half an hour, it, it's very macro. Mm -hmm. You know, to many people say, okay, tangibly, come on, mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, what sort of thing that will affect my life? Yeah. Right? Okay, we'll take a short break. Okay. Robert, um, let's focus uh, a bit on uh, something a bit more tangible. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that uh, a normal Cambodian would feel, okay, well, yeah, it's great. All this uh, uh, public good, the social good, everything. But I got kids. You know, uh, that I want to put to school. Well, I'm an, you know, uh, an, an owner of a small enterprise. Uh, I have 15 people. You know, how am I going to take care of my employee if something happened? All this sort of thing that mm -hmm. many times we, we, we know we have a need, but we just don't know how we handle it. So yeah. what, what's your, your product portfolio? Yeah. Okay, well, that's a, a good question. And, um, y you know, <clears throat> There's a, a saying that um, uh, you know people don't really care how much you know mm. until they know that you you care. Yeah. And you know to help somebody uh, decide on what the right policy is, is for them is that we need to understand what their problem is. Yes. So and how do they prioritize the potential issues that they've got? So it's very important that um, uh, uh, somebody recognizes that they have a need. Yes. And if they have a need, then we can help solve it. Yes. So we can't create problems for people. Hmm. What we want to do is uncover them and then give them the solution. Yes. So, for example, if um, uh, somebody said, look, I have two or three children, I hmm. uh, uh, want to educate them, send them to university, and I know that university costs are high, hmm. therefore, in 10 to 15 years' time, I need 
some money to be able to help me to do that. Yeah. So we would um, uh, look at a policy for them mm. that's called an education protector. Yeah. So that allows them to make regular payments mm. into this policy. The payer is insured yes. so that if anything happens to the payer, mm. right, that that money will be paid out to the family anyway. Yes. And that uh, if he's unable to work through illness, mm. the company will pay the premium yes. for him. Yeah. So he hasn't died, yes. but he actually he's ill. Mm. So when the policy comes to mature, mm. it's there and we'll, we'll pay the uh, university fees to which he's decided what yes. they're going to be yeah. earlier in the in the process mm. so in that product he is protecting the short-term issue if something happens yes. to him yes so uh, that he he's, his family's protected and then should he live as he will, most likely will do he's got the money to pay his uh, uh, first children's school fees mm. and we found that in Cambodia people are very passionate about the children. I mean, people are all around the world, but I think here in particular, because, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, people want to make sure that their children have some of the opportunities that maybe they didn't have. And, and I, I can tell you, uh, Robert, that uh, uh, it has a lot to do with a sad uh, historical past. Mm. Uh, because to most of us who went through the killing field, right? Mm. Whether you know uh, some managed to run away as a refugee, we don't know. It's destiny, mm. right? But uh, now that we have become parents, we have children. We don't want our children to miss the opportunity mm. that we had, uh, and that explains why you know the in the middle class, you can talk to most people in the middle class depending on the, their their status depending on how much money they have saved they have at the, at the, the disposal they will always think first about education for their kids mm -hmm. if they can mm -hmm. afford you know mm -hmm. they go to the next level if they cannot afford that high they come mm -hmm. there right mm -hmm. and even for me personally i i told my my daughter i say you know because you know, I, I went through the killing field. I, mm. as a refugee, I went to the state. You know, I have to do my bachelor in two years, right? Because uh, the state of Virginia will only give the welfare for one year. So after one year, that's it, you know? So I'm on my own. Uh, and for me, I was so desperate to say, look, in one year's time when the welfare check stopped arriving, mm -hmm. you know, I sure don't want to be a dishwasher. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I want to get an education, right? So in the two year, I did no time to, for a break. So I missed the whole uh, university life. It's all about study. Right. I told my daughter, I said, look, you know, I didn't have the opportunity because I have to survive. But I'm not saying, you know, uh, you, you should relax, but Mm. enjoy that life a bit, yes, you know. Yeah. And to me it's a bit more the, 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 the other extreme, the, you know, she's in university already. But to many of Cambodian middle class, mm. it's always, I don't want my kids, you know, to miss that. No, and, and I think it's, it's tremendous the fact that um, people are working so hard to do exactly what you, you've said. Because Cambodia is not at a point where its economy, uh, as in some of the other more advanced economies, whereby yes. people can take education for granted. Yes, it's just yes. there, it's something, it's by yes. right. People in Cambodia, you know, when they uh, really want to send their children to university, it's really down to you as the parent. Yes. And anything we can do to help them yes. achieve that, yes. we, will, we will do. And, um, and that's something that's come across very, very strongly to us in the and, and uh, I think Robert on this one it's a uh, this is something that I think have great merit in term of uh, literacy you know educating people mm. not just about the insurance itself but it's about the effect of that particular policy how it affect you know yeah. their family's future right? yeah yeah uh, absolutely and uh, as I said earlier you know uh, the tragedy is that if something happened to that breadwinner no longer does it the dream die mm, yeah with it yeah 
the money is there mm. and you can actually say right this is what I want yeah, to yeah. I want to do and we have had some situations mm. and you know um, uh, the families have been though very sad mm. they have been tremendously grateful mm. that their breadwinner their father their husband did this yeah. thing very for, selfless thing for to, for to enterprise you have any program for enterprise company mid yeah company, we um, employee uh, we we uh, have entered into the employee benefits okay. uh, market so what okay. does that mean these are um, where you have an enterprise mm. where the business owner wants to have some protection for his uh, staff mm. You know, because so often if um, somebody um, uh, passes away who works in a company, mm. you know, companies are like families. Yeah. So, you know, you run your company yeah, sure, and you've sure. got, I don't know, 30 staff, 30, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And they're all like family. You yeah. know them by name. You sure. probably know their family. Sure, sure. And if something happened to one of them, um, you know, people have a little collection and mm. they mm. send their condolences yes. and they maybe get a few hundred dollars together to give to the family. Well, now, um, uh, you know, people who are running those companies can for as little as 11 cents mm. a day mm. insure their staff for 20,000 US dollars. Less than a cup of coffee. 11 cents a day, I'd say so, yeah. 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 You know, and that is something that, uh, uh, and it doesn't, you know, this isn't about people dying by accident. Yes. This is the fact that, you know, Research has shown that something like 89% of mm. premature deaths mm. in Cambodia are not by accident. Mm. Actually, by illness, uh. natural causes, people who've you know had problems in the past, mm. and unfortunately in their 30s or 40s, yes. it actually catches up with them. Yes. And so the group life policy mm. allows those people mm. to enjoy mm. that okay. kind of protection provided yeah, by, yeah. By, by their employer. So that's an area that's growing mm. fast for us. Yes. Uh, we um, uh, want to develop it further yes. in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Cambodia. Because, you know, I said earlier, this is a three or four hundred year old industry. Yes. So I know products that are available in other countries that mm. aren't available here mm. yet. Okay, okay. And so this is something we're constantly looking yes. at because we, we, we can't just bring everything in yes. too fast because, yes. you know, it's this uh, financial literacy you talked about, yes. people actually understanding yes. uh, how the products uh, work. But, but you also have to work with the, because it's a regulated sector, Yes, you know, yes. You, you still have to work with the, the, the regulator, which is the Ministry of Finance. Uh, in, in your uh, four or five year experience here, how, how is the relation with them? I mean, uh, they, they, they are very supportive yeah, yeah. of the industry, I, I suppose. It, it is. I mean, I think the Ministry of Economic and Finance, um, you know, the government have a vision for, yes. for, for uh, Cambodia in yeah. their financial plan, mm. uh, which you'll be aware of. Life insurance plays an important role in that. And so um, it's been truly collaborative. Yes. Because, you know, we don't know anything about Cambodia. Um, uh, there isn't a lot of expertise about the life insurance industry within yes. Cambodia four years ago. So we meet fairly often, we have collaborated, okay. we have shared our vision mm. and solutions that we want to present to, to them. Yes. Uh, they have helped us uh, with feedback mm. on how the products should, um, should, should, should work. And um, uh, it's been very, it's been a very um, a good relationship, um, and it's been a learning for everybody. Mm, interesting. Because you know, if you go to any other country, yeah, you will find ex-regulators working in the industry, yeah, and you will find ex-private sector people working in the right regulator. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so there's a cross. Pollination, pollination and yeah, so on, of and, uh, and, and which that, is not the case here. No, uh, not yet. Not anyway. yet, because um, it is so so new. And I think that um, uh, uh, you know, I have more contact mm. with um, the regulators here probably than my counterpart mm. in other parts mm, of Asia yes, yeah. because. We're collaborating yes. together. We're learning together. Yeah. So the learning curve is very uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. 
Um, and you know that's been a part of the role that uh, you know I hadn't actually. So it's more it. like a partnership, right? You you the regulator is still new. They want to understand better the industry. Yeah. You know you're the uh, you know industrial actor. You you also need their support and understanding. Yes, yes, so yes, it, yes. it's a public private sector yeah, partnership. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a, it is a know? collaboration. Yeah. But we mustn't forget they are the regulators. Yes. They are there to to ensure yes. that they're um, uh, you know policing the industry. Correctly, yes. they're protecting the mm. consumer. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, so they're getting the right, the right policies, and they obviously, you know, get advice from outside um, consultants, yes. and obviously the yes. uh, the regulators around ASEAN mm. will, will will share experiences. Yes. But it has been a fascinating journey because mm. you know, you know, you're talking about even countries like Malaysia and. Um, uh, um, uh, the Philippines and so on. Uh, the industry is a hundred years old. Hmm. <laughs> it was a hundred years yes, old. Yes. So they have been through many yes. iterations. Yes, of yeah. How to develop the product and and, and regulate the product hmm. and the distribution and and liabilities and so on. And for Cambodia, you know, it's just been like four years uh, of really learning very very fast. Uh, and that's why I think in some cases we will leapfrog yes. other countries mm. and we will get to maybe designing products that uh, will a be the first the, ever. Different, like, like the, the yeah. wing case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting. Uh, and so on. It's very exciting from that mm. point of view. Mm. And that's why I feel younger. I feel like, you know, I have to be open-minded. Yes. Uh, uh, because sometimes, you know, you can be a bit too much of a traditionalist. Yes, yes. And this is the way we do it elsewhere. Yes, exactly. Actually, yeah. Cambodia, maybe we can do things differently because you know, one of the uh, real challenges, and, and, and my bosses uh, are very, very keen on this, mm. is staying close to the customer. Yes. Remember, this is an industry whereby, uh, in time, our customers will have been with us mm. for 20, 25 years. Yes. Now, how do you maintain contact with yes. them? How do you actually mm. keep them engaged? Mm and so on and so we're coming up with all kinds of ideas mm. and these education seminars started to actually plant the seed of why don't we invite our customers to seminars after they've bought yes yes you know um, yeah, sure, sure. so that they can get an update on yes, how our exactly. company is doing, um, uh, the development of new new products mm. and obviously for them to ask questions yes, yes. and say mm -hmm. you know why are you doing this or, or, yes. or, or, or what have you yeah. and that's a new experience yes. uh, for an industry which traditionally hasn't been as close and mm. quite frankly in some countries is seen as quite boring yes <laughs> uh, you know I have a policy yeah, yeah. you know big that's deal it. you yeah. know that's it yeah. um, uh, you know and so you know, we're looking at um, communicating through Facebook yes. and through, you know, the people using their smartphones yes. and also then communicating through through video yes. and uh, and so on. And Good. Well, you know, Robert, I think uh, uh, for a four year experience, you've come a long way, mm. you know, uh, to really make an impression or at least leave an imprint into the local economy, into uh, you know the local uh, population introducing uh, something as novel as life insurance. Uh, four years is not a long time, but uh, if you look at the number that you've been able to, you know, mobilize uh, the trust of twenty-two thousand people, that's a lot of people to trust. Mm. So, so I would say you you come a long way. Mm. Uh, you your company have done a good public good public service uh, to, to help society as a whole because Cambodia is a word of mouth thing you know mm. uh, advertising you did mention advertising social media but nothing is more powerful than you know somebody telling their friend their family look you know uh, I done this 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 and it's probably mm -hmm. the best uh, ambassador message yeah. you know, of confidence so uh, let me congratulate you for a good four year of hard work and uh, another 40 year <laughs> to come hopefully we're all uh, alive yes. by then <laughs> <laughs> so uh, ladies and gentlemen we're coming to the end of the program and uh, it, it's live insurance uh, to a lot of people we talk about something sad
death, that sort of thing. But as you have heard from our exchange, it's not all about death. You know, we should be talking more about life. How can we plan while we're alive to you know, ensure you know, uh, uh, a better life for our children, a better life for ourselves, a you know, better life for our society? And we should look at insurance from that perspective, you know. It's a tool, it's an instrument, a uh, financial instrument made available, you know, for us to plan our future. So on that note, uh, start planning your life. Start planning your children's education. Good night.